Hello everyone, it's Niz. Despite my reviews being focused on indie games, I can't help but notice there isn't an abundance of roguelikes that I've covered, despite there being an ocean's worth since the 2010s. You can find a roguelike for just about any concept or gimmick you can think of. There's at least one out there centered around coins, and the worst part is it's good. But I figured I'd take the time to talk about one that has a special place in my heart. A game that was part of the ocean of roguelikes a decade ago, and is one of the many that have a niche of its own. Not sure how much of a review it is if people know by default that I love this game, but We'll make it work. Today will be a review of One Way Heroics. One Way Heroics is a roguelike RPG made by Smoking Wolf. It has a ton of clear inspiration from Mystery Dungeon, with a heavy emphasis on tile travel, strategic directional positioning, and energy management. Except instead of a dungeon, you're in one of many vast open worlds, with a few things in common with them all. There is always a hero, a grand quest, and a perpetual encroaching darkness devouring the left side of the screen. You, the hero, are sent out by King Victor to defeat the Demon Lord to put a stop to the darkness that is devouring the realm. You'll have to come up with weapons, equipment, and other gear as you level up traveling to the right in order to defeat the Demon Lord. I'm going to get out of the way now. This review will be on Plus Edition. Some may be wondering why I don't review the Mystery Chronicles version that is newer, has more content, and was developed by the company that made Mystery Dungeon to begin with. The simple answer is I don't like it. So I'll be reviewing this game based on the balance of the content included with the expansion of Plus, rather than the original base game. Now with that out of the way, we're going to delve into the meat and potatoes. The gameplay. So, when it comes to objectives in One Way Heroics and the tools to get there, the game starts incredibly simple. You get two classes to pick from, and three perks that you can boost your base stats by one. You can pick between the default mode or the walk in the park mode. Honestly, I recommend starting with walk in the park. When I started this game, which was back in high school, I thought this was the starting difficulty. The default, if you will. But the reason I'm recommending it for newcomers is because it's not a difficulty you'll be going back to very often, and I feel it goes hand in hand with the start of the game. In this difficulty, you move through the world up to 400 kilometers, and the Demon Lord faces off with you. Whatever equipment you have on your person from then to there, you're going to have to work with. In this battle, two hardened warriors eventually show up in your time of need and help you fight the Demon Lord. It's a very standard victory, it ties in with the simplicity of the game's mechanics and a neat bow. But with this, you unlock a new class, and it won't be long until you unlock the other two perk slots for your hero. The advice corner tells you how you did, and you get hero points based on how well you performed overall which gives you access to new perks, as well as expanding something called the Dimension Vault. The Dimension Vault allows you to bring any weapon, armor, accessory, almost anything really, along after the end of a run. Whether you win or die in the end, you can always access the vault and bank your items. This opens up a new realm of possibilities to start a new run with a cool new axe you died with, maybe with a class that fits a bit better. This mechanic here is going to be your best friend. Uh, unless you're a tourist main. You can also spend hero points to repair equipment in the advice corner screen which the cost increases based on the item's value and modified by any bonus effects it carries. So be careful not to put too many powerful modifications on a super rare weapon, or you may just never use it again. Hero points are also used to expand your vault to hoard more precious and unique items, or stockpile ones for a really stupid run, as well as unlocking new and more specialized perks. It's around this point I think I realized for the first time that this game has a lot more to offer than it acts like it does. It's not a huge extravagant twist on the game itself, but a surprise to be sure. And don't think you're gonna get rewarded for dying in the game after finding some good loot and cashing in your hero points, because getting far in the game not only gets you more points, you get special rewards to vault when completing the game. And there's a giant pool of items you can get depending on many variables. Some have you go on completely different adventures entirely to unlock three new classes, those of which also get their own ending for completing their personal campaign again, except as the unlocked class, and easily over a dozen other epilogues. To access these campaigns require for you to expand your starting castle, which you never spend long in, but the items, skills, and companions you can get here can drastically change how a run goes, not even including access to the class-based stories. I know this is sounding more akin to a guy at this point, but trust me, those are the easy ones. You see, the novelty behind One Way Heroics is how much of a sandbox it is to travel through each run. Once you play on difficulties such as Afternoon Stroll and Beyond, you could travel hundreds of kilometers, past dozens of dungeons, biomes, and towns where the loot gets more plentiful as you pass through. The further you go, the more chances you have to get a kindred spirit, an NPC that can help you on your journey. 
All of them have different forms of recruitment, different needs, and provide different benefits to the player, most of which require charisma to recruit, which gets me onto another thing. A lot of things in the game, from party members to stats to boons and saving your game, will require a stat to purchase. If you want to save when Kronos contacts you, that requires 5 levels, but you still keep all the benefits you gained from those 5 levels. They're essentially a currency. The requirement of XP for levels doesn't really scale, so easy come easy go. Although all the stats provide an array of benefits, you may have to spend some of those stats to learn new abilities, or spend charisma to recruit a new NPC or hire mercenaries. But stats are a very important thing to go over for this game, so let's move on to that real quick. Yes, it might come across as silly to cover something as basic as stats, but I do feel like this is very important for the game's mechanics. So bear with me for a minute, alright? The stats have certain aspects that make it far more useful on some classes than others, but each of them have at least one universal effect that make them incredibly invaluable for a hero to use regardless. Charisma is not only used to recruit people, but increases their damage output and helps with shop prices. Vitality not only raises your damage reduction, but each point of vitality gives you an extra point of health regen each hour in game, and trust me, that adds up when the attrition kicks in. Intelligence decreases energy and stamina consumed through actions and increases something called appraisal rate, because you don't automatically know everything you've got your hands on. The hero can discern normal trinkets, sure, but to identify a type of weapon or armor or a bracelet, the modifications, the quality, that requires appraisal rate, or you'll have to depend on your luck when using them. And if you aren't smart enough, you may switch out a nearly broken weapon for a spear you found, only to realize in the game over screen, you were, in reality, trying to kill a polar bear with a really long stick. Attrition and terrible plans make up the vast majority of hero deaths. Always have a plan B. Every class has a different array of stat growth. If you're playing a knight, most levels will increase vitality and strength. But since it's still percentage based, there's still a chance that your knight might get a level path that gives you a lot of agility and you end up an unstoppable force of being incredibly tanky, and frequently having double turns over your less agile enemies. Don't get any ideas though, they pretty much generate what seed of level ups you get before you start the game, so you can't just save scum until you get the stats you want. And some classes straight up don't have access to growth in certain stats. Some classes have special stats that they level up and can make them drastically different from other classes. The pirates are one of the few classes that can gain swimming speed when leveling up, making them one of the few viable options for traveling through water regularly to travel, and giving them a potential escape against most enemies with a cutoff point. The hunter also gets one of these, but with mountain climbing. Without these stats, most heroes may have to burn their special ability to stop time to travel these areas, but with this growth gives these classes a whole new strategy to factor in certain biomes when traveling. And these are the more simple stats in the game because they simply decrease the turns the rest of the world gets while you do so. As mentioned earlier, a lot of the stats have more forms of complexity to them, so each stat has its place even if your class benefits from it less than others. But because of the unpredictability of the stat growth, it gives another layer of uncertainty. You may be given stats that you may otherwise not lean into. I've had runs with unusually strong force users, which is effectively useless until you realize all the food you can carry for your ridiculous metabolism, and pirates that can lockpick doors of legendary relics in only a few turns. You may find yourself depending on weapons you weren't expecting to use, accessories you didn't even know existed until just now. One day you're going to be using a sword that you're attached to, and it's going to drop to one durability, and you're going to have to ask yourself, do I value this sword enough to vault it, before you find yourself for chucking the thing into an enemy and killing it? Because switching weapons burns a turn without dealing damage and frankly the sword was taking up space. Despite the game being all about constantly running to the right in an unyielding manner, it does want you to stop and think carefully about your next turn when things get dire. It's all about improvising once you walk out that castle, especially when it comes to higher difficulties. This is a game that wants you to face things far stronger than you, so it's not only going to reward you for playing clever, it loves to make you look stupid while doing it. There's going to be tons of times you'll run into a building where the only entrance and exit is on the far left side of the building, or the entrance will be straight up covered in mountains, god awful architecture. Yeah, especially if you're a stronger hero rocking an axe, you're often better off smashing through one side of the building and exiting through another hole you've made. Throwing stuff is also a reoccurring one. You may not even throw an item at an enemy, maybe you just need a bit more capacity but you can't burn an item just yet. Or you're a bard and you know there's a vendor nearby, so you just keep throwing this item forward keeping it on the screen while you travel. There are so many stupid yet viable strategies to face enemies and survive, and a lot of them in most regards are strong enough to go toe to toe or even kill the player in a direct encounter. It's easy for them to outnumber you. This means you gotta be creative the further you go and the higher the difficulty. If an item only has one purpose, you're using it wrong. 
and is the main antagonist of the base game. In all honesty, the Demon Lord is the least threatening enemy once you've learned the ropes. The Demon Lord is someone you will have to eventually defeat, and due to the barriers spawned on the Demon Lord each appearance, even at their minimum you can't just hit and run to whittle her down casually. You will have to commit at some point, but with each encounter she will spawn less barriers until hitting the minimum, which is I think is 5. And with each encounter you've injured her, it's less health for the next fight. Also, a ton of the classes outside of Mayak mode are faster than Demon Lord, so you can just avoid her until you're on the terms that you're confident with. A resourceful player can avoid the Demon Lord with nothing but a stone wall scroll. Check this out. Well, the game's true difficulty comes in as gaining distance in the actual run. The more valuable gear is further off in the world, kindred spirits will be encountered as you travel further, and longer runs yield more hero points for rewards. And with how the Demon Lord functions outside of Walk in the Park, you're outright encouraged to wear out encounter after encounter. Attrition has revealed itself to be a double-edged sword. It's not her you need to be afraid of, it's them. And despite the heavy improvisation you're going to experience from this game, there are things that do remain constant and give you a consistent toolkit to work with, primarily your class and the starting perks, which will pretty much determine not only how you travel the world as mentioned earlier, but how you face enemies, which party members that you may prefer to bring along, if you're even capable of getting any, and how you conduct or avoid combat. The knight likes to face most things head on and brace against what would one or two shot most classes. Due to the knight's passive, mispositioning is no longer truly a factor, but the ninja is completely capable of avoiding most encounters with their high emphasis on agility and decreased enemy detection range, and some incredibly useful abilities. But to compensate, they reduce the maximum stamina pool when you use them, so you have to pick carefully what to utilize. As a bard, you're not only highly dependent on your allies, you're also using your charisma as a resource, as keeping a hold of the charisma you amass makes your allies even more powerful, but later on you can spend it to make certain monsters allies, which can be a life or death decision against strong enough opponents, but becomes more expensive with each use. You likely won't use it more than twice. The force user goes from the most annoying, inconvenient, energy management focused class in the game, to absolutely godlike when you start getting them to scale and learning the abilities available in their toolkit, and also once you get an angry stacked staff of praying from the dimension vault. But remember Remember that everything has durability, and even the most powerful legendary gear will eventually break if used enough without repair from a really specific item in runs, having enough money to pay off a blacksmith which aren't very common either, or to get it repaired in the advice corner screen. In fact, most legendaries, including the game's completion one, typically have low durability to compensate for their overwhelming force. It's a good way to encourage you to play around with what the game has to offer. And you're not just out of luck if you're given something that doesn't really mesh well normally. Every class can make any weapon work. Obviously, some classes are better with certain weapons than others, but there's nothing stopping a ninja from swinging an axe around when the going gets tough, which plays in the very nature of improvisation that the game is full of. The wide array of perks you can unlock and the combinations to use them can lead to a ton of possibilities as well. Maybe you don't mind being dependent on certain gear and are a bit picky, so you boost your character's appraisal rate to more easily identify gear. And then you put points in the equipment expert to make sure it takes longer to wear out. Or maybe you're the extreme opposite and you don't want to depend on anything, so you just go hero, strip naked, and punch the demon lord to death with 5 stacks of pro wrestler. Which is such a frequent occurrence, I would basically call it the initiation for anyone starting the game. It's also hilariously effective. You could bring around a pet and have enough starting silver to buy the first overpriced thing in the nearest town. Actually, the pet perk also stacks its power, so if you have all 5 slots on it, it's bigger and way stronger. These perks, along with access to the Dimension Vault, as well as access to the minor abilities, starting armor, and pets that the castle expansion system can provide, leaves tons of terrifying possibilities for you to have a head start for any type of run that you'd like to have. But if you'd rather go for a challenge, you can forego the vault, the castle bonuses, and the perks all together. If you really want to spice things up, later in the game you begin to unlock negative perks, which still take up a perk slot, but give a detrimental effect. Some work like character flaws, while others work more like a challenge mode, and activating them multiplies your final score at the end game screen, and also gives you more flavor text for making a character in my opinion. My personal favorite as of late is Old Man Abernaki, a hero who's been around the world a few times, and has found unimaginable treasure in his journey. He starts out with a gun from the vault, has three stacks of equipment management to make it last, one stage of pack horse so he can effectively carry the gun, and due to his old age, I gave him poor eyesight. Abernaki is now a fugitive for gunning down what he thought was a monster, but turned out to be a traveling chef. There are tons of strats to make up if you're willing to mess with the system enough and vault what you need to do it. There's nobody to stop you from training a cow for a deicide. 
except maybe the Jade Forest organization, but screw them. They talk about how much they love animals and shoot my dog without a second thought. Evade the law and taxmen, except for the toll booth attendant, who can be passionately labeled the game's IRS. Not even including that, I can see how the game may be daunting to some at first startup. Up there is the clock that tells you when the Demon Lord will spawn, as well as the randomized group of powerful enemies ranging from packs of tigers to rampant rabbits. This is your mini-map. It provides limited but valuable information on the area ahead. Over here is not only your passive, but staff X on you and what impact they have on your character. Very useful, but we'll take up a bit of your screen. Here's your health, simple, stamina and energy, which are two very different things, and don't forget your hotkeys, which are more or less useless unless you fiddle with them in the options menu. Honestly, in my years of playing, I only just now decided to do so. It definitely can be a bit of a bump in the early play, but fortunately, a lot of it is straightforward, which also makes it all the more easier to figure out what can be exploited. I will admit, with this freedom and a landfill of loopholes, one Way Heroics is a bad habit of encouraging you to be immoral. I genuinely think this game is the most evil I have ever been by choice in an RPG, which is funny considering the game doesn't actually have any endings where you side with the forces of evil. You might be a jerk is all. Just a heads up, shopkeepers drop all their things when they die, but you get a bounty if you harm or kill them, but if they were killed by a monster, that's a different story, which often happens on its own, but sometimes you lead one to the merchant section of the village. Always remember when you're using items or prepping to heal, that takes time. Turn your back to your opponent so that you can use your party member as a shield. Okay, look, if they don't want me to use fire against my enemies, they shouldn't have made it so damn effective. Are we going to condemn the entire planet because I couldn't square up with this. If you don't got the ambitions to push what mankind is capable of, we will always wonder if an owl strapped with five bombs can chain them and kill the demon lord, but because of the heroism of Bomjamin and his clueless friend, we know the answer is not even close. The king would approve my methods, even if he did question the necessity of my actions. However, I think he has skeletons in other castles to address over the hero being such a disappointment. But if we're going to question the contents of the king's character, well first I would have to reevaluate the war crimes I've been committing, but we would also have to go a bit more into the story aspect of the title. So let's move on to that. The story of One Way Heroics is incredibly simple, but simultaneously I find it fascinating. The more you progress through the game, and the more you fiddle with the boundaries, the more it becomes clear to you. You know the gist at the start, the Demon Lords brought about this all-consuming darkness in the world. You, the hero, have been appointed by the Wise King Victor to stop the encroaching darkness by slaying the Demon Lord. As you travel through the dimension to either succeed or fail in your journey, you meet multiple characters that help in the world building when you bond with them. Expository, yes, but each character gives a bit of insight of the world or of events on their perspective. Except for Panty Shot, he's just... <laughs> yeah. Dosi is an example of the lethal and even mutating effects of the darkness, and you come to learn that the king is far more powerful than initially depicted, as he is a strong mage and a necromancer. He had used the forbidden arts to bring back to life his daughter, Queen Frieda, and Duke Galtz as her personal bodyguard. Which I assume he just doesn't have the power of resources to continue doing that because why the hell is he not bringing me back? And at this point, you don't know what else the king could possibly be hiding from you. But from what you've seen so far, he's still not the enemy. It is important to note that these companions will often give you things or power up when you bond with them. Queen Frieda makes holy weapons easily accessible to all classes of hero. Which is important later, it has more uses than making the demon lord an easy solo. As for Dozy... She gives you a drug called the Buddy Tablet. This tablet can supposedly befriend anyone. If your curiosity gets the better of you and you check out the hints in the game, you could use this Buddy Tablet drug on even the Demon Lord. Then the Demon Lord doesn't suddenly become friends with you, but does stop attacking. In fact, when you begin asking questions, she answers them. And the truth is far more grim. The Demon Lord didn't summon the darkness, but has awakened it. Which may not seem like much of a difference at first, but the origin of the darkness drastically changes all of this. The darkness had awoken several years ago and wiped out humanity. The race she is a part of, which we will call the Immortals, as we never get a name, survived and did what they could to restore humanity. They now go through this process where they awaken the darkness before it can rest 10,000 years and restore its power to a rate they can't stop. Then they kill the one who enacted that ritual to stir it awake, and the darkness goes back into its slumber. The person has to fight back in this process. The first time they attempted this, the person who awoke in the darkness had committed suicide and to no effect. So it seems for the effects of the darkness, the one who summons it must be an immortal from the previous era and must be slain and they have to fight back, as to submit would once again be considered suicide. 
The Immortals tragically never found a way to defeat the darkness, and as their numbers dwindled, the resources to look into it is simply gone in the wind. And so Who Remains settles for merely delaying it. They've been doing this to the point where they are facing extinction. Sarah is one of the last two Immortals that remain, and her brother Victor is the other one. And once Victor is slain after taking up the mantle of Demon Lord, probably a century or so from now, humanity will have 10,000 years left to live or figure out how to defeat the darkness. So a nation of humanity is on the brink of dramatic leadership shift. We're out of ideas. The people who are left to deal with the problem once they're gone understand the darkness less than they do. We're merely delaying the inevitable. Well, that certainly puts a damper on the standard Slay the Demon Lord premise we've been working with here. But you know what? Not all hope is lost, because remember, you're the hero. The dimension-hopping, rapid-reincarnating, war-criming, <coughs> surrogate-parenting hero. Reality is your plaything, and with all the items you've been vaulting, all the classes you've played, some of which were lucky or sketchy enough to get a hold of holy weapons, now is your time to shine. And spite the darkness by throwing relics at it! Or use a holy bow, that's more practical, I suppose. And you can face the darkness once and for all. And hell, if you fight the darkness and use a bite tablet on the Demon Lord, you can tell her how you found a way to fight the darkness, and convince her to face it alongside you. It's not an easy fight, the darkness still consumes you, so you need a very specific arsenal to effectively face it, and it destroys everything in its path when it breathes fire, even sometimes spawns powerful minions. But once you slay the dragon in the darkness, you not only put it to a stop, but destroy it as a whole. It will never be summoned again. You saved the world forever from this threat. And some might think this is a happy enough ending, you know, other than the fact that that none of these endings have a potential happy one for the Demon Lord. She still either dies, commits suicide after you destroy the darkness, or destroys the darkness with you, her body gives out from the side effect of the ritual of bringing it about, and she asks to be buried somewhere nice. But what if I were to tell you it doesn't end there? No, in One Way Heroics, it's not enough to beat the Demon Lord and stop the darkness, and then improve the lives of those around you. It's not enough to even kill the darkness itself and save the world from its encroachment forever. You've only saved one timeline of one dimension. You gotta take your mementos from all your friends and past lives, any dimension golden get your grubby hands on for this journey, and venture into the dimensional passageway to kill the godlike being that is behind the existence of the darkness in each dimension to begin with. Say what you want about the hero, they certainly rise to the occasion. To reach this passageway is already a trial in and of itself. You need to be on a higher difficulty, you need to have killed the darkness before, and you need to gather enough dimension gold in one run to even open up the gateway. But to face the roller, you have to survive long enough in the dimension for it to spawn, fighting against enemies you may have never faced before. I will admit, the dimension ruler as a boss is fairly underwhelming. It's basically just Demon Lord Plus. You travel until it spawns, it has barriers, the maximum barrier amount decreases every spawn, and you whittle it down the best you can. The big differences being that this boss is stronger, has summons which are incredibly annoying as they can blind you or put a stacking effect that reduces your damage. That's the highest health enemy in the game, it doesn't need these. And a phase 2 that has a spell much like the Demon Lord, except this one can't be countered by moving diagonally. And also since it's not fire damage, it has less direct counters in the form of equipment. Don't get me wrong, this is a step up from the Demon Lord, but to access this boss, you have to defeat the Dark Dragon at least once. Which makes sense narrative-wise, but also the Dragon is just a better designed boss. The Demon Lord is at the end of the day a puppet to all this, doing what she does out of duty and obligation to her people and the ones she's trying to protect. And is thus just an especially powerful creature, a sprite that takes up a tile. The Dimension Ruler comes across as an enemy trying to feel like the stakes are higher by being a bit bigger and having larger stats. The only cool narrative choice I think was done here is that the sprite is the unknown enemy sprite, kind of implying that the Dimension Ruler is beyond human comprehension, this strange being of light that can't fully form into thought. But they sort of forgo that immediately in the second phase with the Dragon of Light Body. The concept art rightfully depicts it as being huge, which has a scale with a sprite that makes sense. But the thing is, there's one department it doesn't compete with Dark Dragon in, and it's an invaluable one for a boss. Presence. The Dimension Ruler is this huge being with minions, a powerful spell, a huge health pool, and an alternate form, but the Dark Dragon is one with the darkness. It is the primary conflict that is in every single run of One Way Heroics, even when it's not the focus. Even runs that forego fighting the Demon Lord, the dragon is still there, lurking. Sure, the Dimension Ruler seems to control the darkness as well, since when you enter the passageway, the dragon runs off, but the darkness still persists. But the dragon is pretty much synonymous with it, and the ruler never weaponizes this power otherwise. The only way 
way to face off with the dark dragon is to provoke it with a weapon worthy of harming it, a holy weapon. Well, actually, there are two other ways. By throwing at it an incredibly rare, offensively rotten Nyuta fruit, or discovering all of knowledge at once. The point is, there's a high cost entry fee for this battle. The Dark Dragon is still the darkness, so if you attack too close to it, the darkness will consume and instantly kill you. The dragon's slow, but its form of attack is a telegraphed breath attack that is multiple tiles wide, and the length of the entire screen. Anyone that's caught in it that isn't fireproofed is pretty much guaranteed to die. The breath also clears out terrain, flattens mountains, and destroys villages instantly. The fact that it's encroaching on you from the edge of the screen and is never quite envisioned, using the largest AoE attack in the game where no obstacle can obscure it, dealing enough damage that nobody without fire nullification stats can be expected to survive more than two blasts, makes the dragon feel like the larger than life threat that it should be. Being able to see this destruction from this scale and perspective makes it feel like one of those legendary battles of a hero slaying a dragon that you're sure someone was exaggerating. And it's only further emphasized by it playing the triumphant music that was playing when you fight the demon lord in the walk in the park difficulty and some allies show up to aid you. This is a battle of the ages, except this time, you weren't led along for a fraction of the map. You've traveled multiple dimensions and donned weapons of past lives. You're no longer surrounded by plot-convenient strangers, but allies that you've met and earned the love and respect of in your journeys, emboldened by the multiple mementos that they give you. The music being used here tells you, we're doing it for real this time. The Dimension Ruler just doesn't have that much fanfare in their battle, and if you're not convinced by all of this, might even think it's a little pretentious, or you're intending to point out that the Dimension Ruler is far more difficult than the Dark Dragon, which is true. I'll leave this off on a simple comparison before we move on. What happens if you use the Scroll of Reclusiveness against the Dimension Ruler? It can't get through, and depending on how deep you are in the fight, you can wait out the clock and fight it some other time. What happens if you use the Scroll of Reclusiveness against the Dark Dragon? But we should get back to it. You may be wondering why I delayed talking about the ending from the step of slaying the Dark Dragon to the step of slaying the Dimension Ruler. And that's because I wanted to point out this is not as well designed of a protagonist, and the idea of removing an entity in charge of causing all the dimensions turmoil, that is the backbone of the roguelike feature that is the main gimmick of a game, is a pretty bad idea on a story standpoint, unless you're willing to drastically change the game in response to the consequences of that leap in the plot. I think the Dimension Ruler ending is something that should be built up to, and absorbed because of the 24 endings in the game, I think this one's the most noteworthy. After the hero slays the Dimension Ruler, the ruler's body starts to evaporate into specks of light, which the hero is exposed to, giving them godlike powers and regaining memories of their past lives. They turn to the darkness, tell it to stop, and it dissipates, leaving only the dragon. Then the hero pieces together with the Dimension Ruler's power, they could hop from dimension to dimension, so there's nothing really stopping them from traveling through the passageway and saving more worlds. The hero takes this even further and goes backwards in time at one point to a dimension just before the upcoming Demon Lord completes the ritual to awaken it and destroys the darkness. And then, out of curiosity, Fast forward a time and saw how the people he was friends with lived their new lives. He sees nearly all of them prosper in a peaceful world. The queen gets to live a normal life guarded by a presumably normal Duke Galtz. The king continues ruling for a few years before putting his daughter in charge, and in which he returns to his role as an immortal, protecting humanity from the shadows with his would-be demon lord sister, Sarah. Dosi gets to live a normal and humble life in her village. Everything is great for just about everybody, except Iris, who doesn't come into existence in this timeline. This is because she is artificially created to aid the hero to fight the darkness, but she's still with the hero in the timeline they ascend. So not much has been lost in that regard. The hero isn't sure how long the power will last, and they decide to go into the passageway and simply find a new world to save, and legend has it that the hero is out there saving worlds with their fairy sidekick to this day. So, from my understanding, the hero ascended to a godlike state, and could end the darkness at will in dimensions, and had a few times, and even done so at one point before it even had the chance to hurt their generation. They stopped the darkness at least twice, and wandered around a bit after seeing what a timeline saved sooner would look like, then decided they had their fill of this power, and set off to go into another dimension and save them in adventuring, rather than using the immense power that they have to save as many worlds as possible for as long as possible, or investigating further how the world would look if they stopped the darkness and saved all the immortals, or anything really. What I'm saying is the hero gained access to a huge well of power to waltz through time and space, to cease or begin this world-ending disaster at will, and they stopped using it solely because they got bored. Let me tell you, after reflecting on this for so long, for what they were going for in this finale, 
I think this ending is nearly perfect. The very idea of disregarding efficiency, of wasting this boundless potential of power to much rather brute force or outwit the problem into submission, is probably the best representation of One Way Heroic's endgame I could think of. When reading this, I thought to myself, seriously, the hero did that? No, never mind, of course they did. Because at the end of the day, I don't think the game's protagonist is meant to be some sort of paragon. I think that the hero, at heart, is a thrill seeker doing great acts of good incidentally. We're talking about a being of constant reincarnation attuned to a bank accessing the contents of previous lives. The hero is so powerful already, that even more power doesn't sound appealing. Because power wasn't what the hero was in it for, it was the adventure. So the very idea that you cannot even convince the hero that they could save hundreds of worlds in a matter of hours, just staying in this dimension and destroying the darkness in each one like a production line, the fact you can't appeal to that sense of duty with this power, and instead of using it for selfish means, they simply discard it, it is incredibly telling of just how bizarre of a being the hero truly is. And that we should be grateful that this is the one force of nature we have on our side, even if it doesn't seem to have our interest in mind all the time. I also find it somewhat poetic that the demon lord that has awoken the darkness that will potentially devour the world actually cares a lot more about humanity than the hero who saves them all. But this ending is not without its flaws, the obvious one being that you just killed the being responsible for making these disasters to begin with, which narratively means you saved all of existence from any continued darkness, or at least prevent any future occurrences in other timelines or dimensions. And yet the game continues on. It's obviously not a plot hole that you still face the darkness in other dimensions, because they can very easily be written as timelines the Dimension Ruler had set up all of this before being slain. Yet the story itself doesn't really acknowledge this major achievement you've made afterwards, as you can still fight the Dimension Ruler again, which unintentionally implies that you can't defeat it for good. The problem with these types of stakes being set in a roguelike means that Smoking Wolf had basically three options. One, to set a grim or maybe bittersweet message that this can be fought and bested, but never at its source, it can never truly be beaten. Two, to write that the world has become a better place because the thing that was making it worse has been put to a stop, and ignore the fact that nothing has mechanically or narratively changed to reflect that. Or three, to drastically change the game for players who reach past this point to reflect their great achievement. Wolf chose the second one, which I will admit was probably the most realistic option to take here, but this is still patching over a self-inflicted issue. The best I think a player can do at this point is pay no mind to the lack of change and conclude that that was, in fact, the true and final epilogue for the game. Which makes sense, you have to meet a lot of requirements to get to this point, and complete all the other primary epilogues. But this isn't really a solution, it's mostly just not acknowledging the problem. But I will give it's not the worst ending I've been exposed to. I do feel like the implications this applies to the hero gives it a sense of intrigue that gives it some form of redemption. If I were to grade this ending, I'd probably give it a C. I think that's a nice little note to leave the story off on. Best to start getting things tied up with soundtrack, art, and other details. This could be a generally larger category than usual for the sheer fact I don't feel like I need to cover the post-game or replay value for a roguelike. Sure, it can vary, but you know what you're signing up for in that department. The game's soundtrack is unfortunately not an OST, but rather a mishmash of multiple composers' free music. And you may even notice with how the music drastically changes in style very often, there's at least five different composers for all the music here. But I do think that the game using multiple forms of music, even in the same type of areas you would typically go through, does help reduce the sense of repetition, where simultaneously I don't think I've heard a single song that sounded out of place in a scenario. This music here, the way it plays, I feel like spans out to this vast, empty sea of snow you're exposed to. This music in the dungeon does a very good I need to get out of here vibe, and although I think it's a bit much in normal dungeons, it does keep a reminder of the dark presence that's just behind you. And with them adding more songs into the plus edition, which involves the player having to complete good amounts of the base game to experience most of, I did feel a thematic sense of the game blooming into something greater as I push further into completing more and more arcs. Like the game was encouraging and rewarding my curiosity. But not with better loot, it does give you better loot, but that's besides the point, but with a more expansive and grand experience. I found this game to be aesthetically pleasing as the pixel art of the game's sprites are a balanced medium between layered and simplistic. Although some look a smidge generic and very much in the RPG Maker overworld sprite format, I think these sprites complement the symbiosis of detail and simplicity in the game, especially with the dotted eyes, making it so that they don't take up the majority of the face while being a low-res sprite. I'd call them unique enough for their purpose, and there's very obviously effort put in to keep the asymmetrical sprites consistent with whichever side they're facing, so it's not just mirroring the sides and calling it a day. 
It's also worth noting that it's not an RPG Maker game. Smoke and Wolf had made an engine for all their games, and One Way Heroics is tragically the only one translated to English, so as the book about the development, I am in shambles. The game does drop the ball on enemy sprites, I'm afraid to admit. They're consistent with the hero sprites, but there is a very limited array of them. This is a standard demon, and this is an infected villager. Shortcuts have obviously been taken. Another example is that every sprite is in a perpetual loop of walking animations in the direction they're facing, which I actually like. This matches the constant motion of the game. It, it's very thematically appropriate, but it's also clearly done to cover that there is no actual attack animations. I still think it looks nice personally, and appreciate that weapons have different visual effects when you use them even if you're just always lunging forward. I really appreciate the character portraits in the corner, I think the art style adds personality to the game, and I personally appreciate the hero classes have naked versions for some reason, but what it has in simplicity is also its strength as it's quick and easy to start, easy to run, and takes up practically no disk space. Unfortunately, it's no longer DRM free or else this would be the perfect game to just carry around on a flash drive. The online system, I will admit, is really nice though. The weekly events that have unique catches to them, or lets you play out a companion's plotline for free on a daily event, are very useful for people who don't play as often, and the online feature doesn't usually come to play unless you're playing with an online daily or weekly world, but it is amusing seeing the builds of other players and then getting blessed from their ghost for a free level when they end up dying horribly. You also get to compare runs with other players and see the progress of their adventures or where they last left off. Remember to show respect for those tourists out there, no matter what you're dealing with they probably have it worse than you do. The game has rather simple controls, and once you learn how to hold shift and face a direction without moving, the world's basically your oyster. I do feel the need to point out one of the reasons I've been reviewing Plus Edition One Way Heroics, rather than the base game, then include Plus afterwards, is that Plus Edition has so much more content added to the base game, it's pretty much the actual game. One of the issues on this, however, is that this game has gotten quite a lot of quality of life changes over the years, and unfortunately some of them are exclusive to Plus Edition. Some of the really good ones too. Like the option to auto-pause your wandering briefly when there's an enemy a few tiles from you and you're not in combat, or the feature that makes your character automatically look at the nearest NPC for interaction. Which means that you're not only missing out on the expansion related things, but you're just dealing with an inferior product in design if you're only getting the base game. Which I have to voice I don't think is fair for the customer. A lot of these changes could have easily been put into a standard while keeping the exclusive features of Plus Edition. But if I'm going to go over the selling points of value, I'm, I'm already getting into the verdict. So it may be for the best to just get into that. One Way Heroics is a roguelike that's very clearly trying to be a side-scrolling mystery dungeon with a built-in gimmick to try to spice things up, and I wholeheartedly think it succeeds. There's a lot of effort put in this game that you can very easily spot if you look into the mechanics. The game is simple, but has a skill ceiling that leaves room for absurd strategies that are enjoyable to share with others. I think it holds up to this day as a sandbox that encourages you to mess around with things by making them fun to exploit and making you leave your comfort zone enough to experiment. The game very obviously gets its tone. It takes itself as seriously as a game where a battle axe is too heavy and the solution is to throw it at a bandit should. When it comes to purchasing the game, I think you really should get the plus edition or else you're really missing out on what it can provide. As I said earlier, it's not just an addition or an expansion, it's pretty much a whole new game. But the game and the DLC at full price are $10 well worth more than the asking price at this point in my opinion. And if you're still hesitant, you should know that frequently goes on sale and just how generous the sale rates are. You could easily get the full thing for $3 if you want to wait. I certainly would recommend at least giving it a try if Mystery Dungeon S games are up your alley, or you'd like to try out a ton of roguelikes, because I think this one certainly is a hidden gem. But I think that's all for now. I hope you all have a good day and be safe.